Okay, now without further ado, we have the great pleasure this morning. We have two distinguished uh, speakers for us. First, we'll be hearing from Hilary Hanahoy, and then second from Celine Heino. Our first speaker with Hillary, and uh, as Klaus said yesterday, we are informal, so we can go with first name basis, even if we have many professors, directors, and doctorates. But Hillary, I wanted to say just a few words about you and your organization. Hillary is with the Research Data Alliance in beautiful Italy, and the Research Data Alliance, which is known as the RDA, is a research community organization started back in 2013 by the European Commission the American National Science Foundation and National Institute of Standards and Technology and the Australian Department of Innovation. So it really was a very, very global innovation. Its mission is to build the social and technical bridges to enable open sharing of data. And it continues to grow. Uh, the RDA has over 9,000 individual members from 137 countries. So absolutely fantastic success in the past couple of years. Today, Hillary will talk about rewards and incentives for open science, a global registry, a global collaboration. The registry is currently being designed and developed in an open and collaborative way. So without further ado, Hillary, can you see and hear me okay? I can, David, can you hear me? We hear you fantastic, wonderful. Great. And I know you're in Italy, could you tell me exactly where you are in Italy? Oh, I'm in a tiny little village of 6,000 inhabitants called Calci, which is just outside uh, Pisa. So it's central Italy. Okay, Pisa, ah, the tell... Leaning Tower. Uh, very close to the Leaning Tower. Yeah. Very good. And one thing that you would say in your town, that you, 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 I, I know it's next to Pisa, but in your town, in your city, something to see or something special about it, in case oh, we, well, we have a there. Yeah, we're so fortunate here. We have an amazing, what they call, I think they translate it in, Ita in English into a charter house. So it's a fantastic old monastery, but it has the largest uh, national history uh, museum in Italy in it. So wow. in our tiny little village, we have that uh, wonderful uh, place to visit. Wonderful. I'm a, I mean, I love Germany, but one of my big reasons for loving it is being so close to Italy. Beautiful country. Very good. <laughs> Okay, then without further ado, two things also to our audience. As we did yesterday, please feel free to, to bring in the, the questions and we'll go through with that. That's a great job. And I think without further ado, to both our speakers, we have about 20 minutes for the talk and then about 10 minutes for Q&A. So Hillary, please, the digital stage is yours. Thank you so much, David. Uh, there's my slides. So uh, thank you very much to the organizers for this very kind invitation to speak to you all uh, this morning or this evening or wherever you are in the world. Thank you for joining us. I saw some figures yesterday that uh, showed a wonderful uh, participation. And as an organization, the Research Data Alliance that itself organizes virtual uh, or meetings on, uh, uh, on a six monthly basis, we've gone virtual too. And uh, while the death disappointing part is that we can't all sit and look at each other and I can't see your faces as I speak to see are you interested or would like me to move on. Um, on the other hand, virtual meetings are allowing um, many, many more people to access and to listen to the uh, things that we have to say and to learn and to share experiences. So that's the upside of this downside. So um, I would like to talk to you this morning about um, a global collaboration, a registry for rewards and incentives for open science, or indeed we probably should be, it's probably better to call it a research assessment uh, registry. The, um, so the, of course I'm not alone in my, my slide is moving on or not? Aha. Um, so I'm not alone in this quest, uh, of course, as you can see, there's a powerhouse of uh, uh, directors and people, ladies, of course, uh, supporting in this uh, volunteer effort at this moment in time. Um, and uh, each of us have our day jobs and things like that. But why are we all doing this? Well, as the story progresses, as I talk to you uh, for these next few minutes, you'll see that there is a context and a background to why many of us are involved in it uh, at the moment. But 
of course. Um, also, I think I could say from having uh, from working with these uh, wonderful group of people is also the real understanding that this is a must. What we propose and what we are working together with many, many others uh, around the world to do is something that is really fundamentally required now. So, but I do want to give a shout out to them because uh, it's truly, as I said, a volunteer effort on uh, their behalf. So why does all of this matter? Well, I mean, you know, the conference is the Open Science Conference. So I hope that I am preaching, if you like, to the converted about, uh, you know, open science is really fundamental. It's been talked about for many years. We hear and we see that there has been lots of progress particularly with the pandemic that we are all living in and it has uh, it has um, you know driven us to to reflect more and to actually practice it more but it's true that um you you know there's still many challenges and i think anna in her wonderful opening presentation yesterday uh, presenting and telling giving us updates on the unesco activities show you know said that there are many, many complexities, there are many challenges, many nuances to the whole um, open science and open research aspect. And one of the things that I loved, uh, or the things that I'd like to pick up, it's not a quote because I'm not sure if I word it exactly, but she did say that looking to the future, young scientists are keen to share. You know, it's in their DNA and we know that now. They're, we are, they're the digital, if you like, uh, um, generation. But career assessment and how they're valued within the institutions are not in line with the open science policies and the practices uh, that are being proposed and that are being, you know, uh, shared. And I saw yesterday while I was watching the Twitter feed on the open science, um, Ewan Burney, who's a, you know, a wonderful scientist himself, had that lovely quote to say, you know, open shared data simply, data simply realizes synergies for science. It's as simple as that. Science is best done in the open. So really the, uh, the thing is that we all advocate for uh, open science and uh, and but again the people on the ground the uh, scientists and the researchers involved we talk about how they need a cultural and a behavioral change but we need to support that that's on us you know those of us who are in a position to do so who are working in this field we need to help them to do that and we must practice what we preach we have to be open um, we have to be transparent and we have to um, allow them, uh, you know, in the assessment, in the change around rewards and incentives, we must show and demonstrate and illustrate the practices uh, and, uh, and that are going on in the world so that they can learn from that. So what are the origins um, of this? Well, open science is... There's a delay here. So, so um, the background, if you like, for this uh, for this registry that I will talk to you about comes from, of course, me, uh, work uh, that was done over four years by the Open Science Policy Platform. And one of the, uh, uh, I extracted a quote, if you like, from the, the report, which I like the, the last part of it, that open science must ultimately be embedded as part of a larger and more systemic effort to foster all practices and processes that enable the creation, the contribution, the discovery and the reuse of research knowledge in a reliable, effective and equitable way. And it can't research science, they can't be excellent. We can't ask for excellent science without these sort of attributes at their core. So this, uh, uh, as I said, the, the, the shift, if you like, to open science within this open science policy platform was set up in 2016 um, by the European Commission. And it had a series of, I think it's over 25 different stakeholders who uh, represented many, many different um, pan-European and indeed global, in the case of the Research Data Alliance and others, um, uh, organizations to discuss um, and to uh, talk and make recommendations on open science. And they, in the first mandate, so it was split into two mandates in 2016 and 2018, they delivered a series of uh, recommendations. And of course, the challenge uh, in adoption was already very, very apparent then that the current evaluation system 
forces researchers to focus on the research articles and to seek publication in high impact venues. And that is clearly not incentivizing open research, open science behaviors. And in the second mandate uh, from 2018 and 2020, the focus then um, in, in it, together with other things was on the shift, how to shift the focus of re rewards and incentives and to um, support this uh, uptake of next generation metrics. So um, the report, which is freely available on the uh, uh, internet, the progress on open science towards a shared research knowledge system um, and had these two fundamental recommendations, which are the basis for why we talk today and why we started the work on this research assessment registry. So uh, the, pro the platform itself called for uh, pilots and implementations of responsible metrics and made a, a clear call for the creation of a registry to support these assessment and mechanism uh, practices. Yeah. So just why you wonder, well, why uh, is the Research Data Alliance involved in this? David gave you a slight uh, in the introduction uh, to, my, to me this morning. David mentioned the uh, organization that I work for, the Research Data Alliance. I am very proud and very honored to be the Secretary General of a wonderful global community of over 11,500 um individuals and data practitioners from across 146 countries across the globe. Uh, we have over 60 uh, uh, organizations who are members and who support the work. But fundamentally, the Research Data Alliance is an international, it's a community driven and a volunteer organization. And as I said, we have this global community of data practitioners and experts that are committed to the principles of open science, of open research, of fair data. And they work together in different ways to um, build these technical and social bridges. And RDA is founded on uh, six fundamental guiding principles of openness, of consensus, that things are community driven, that there's harmonization and inclusivity in all that's done and all that's produced and that it's not for profit and technology neutral. And so the Research Data Alliance, among all the group of organizations that were in the policy platform, offered to spearhead and coordinate uh, this work in a collaborative, cooperative, and co-creative way. And that is how we work, and that is how um, we intend to support this alliance. So just let me be very clear, it's not the Research Data Alliance's uh, registry, it is the community's registry, but somebody needs to uh, support it and coordinate it, and together with the colleagues and their organisations that I showed at the beginning, and more besides, um, we are driving ahead with this. So what already exists, you know, there's lots and lots of, uh, there are lots of things. So what, what really exists? Well, we know that there are uh, many, many high level expert groups have been formed around different aspects. And it, that just goes to show the complexity of the uh, uh, issue that we're dealing with. There are many reports and surveys out there frameworks and policies that, um, you know, can go to support uh, the, the thing. Of course, DORA, who are um, involved, the, de the Declaration of Research Assessment, are fundamental and have been working, you know, uh, in for many, many years on this. And it's been signed, as you can see, their declaration by over 2,000 organizations. And they have a huge network of individuals that support it. Um, at the moment, indeed, if you go and visit their a website, you'll see a wonderful series of case studies on reimagining academic assessment and stories of innovation and change, which are being compiled together with the European University Association and Spark Europe, who are involved in this as well, and who you, any of you who, who followed yesterday would have heard uh, Vanessa's wonderful um, outline of uh, the difficult uh, realm of infrastructures and sustainability uh, of these fundamental infrastructures. But but uh, Dora will, by the way, together with those two organizations, be running a webinar on the 25th of February if you want to know more about the case studies. But just to say that the Dora involvement in this is key, it's fundamental, it's crucial, and it is very much uh, there. So that's a, you know, another global example. I 
There are many, many programs and policies around that uh, we know of um, and that are starting up. I'm going to pick, if you like, on the Dutch uh, Rewards and Recognition Programme as an exemplar of national level policies. Um, and here in Europe, the Dutch are always quite uh, advanced in terms of their, uh, their activities. And I think that, you know, there are a couple of things that I wanted to highlight from their program. Um, the idea that, you know, a system of this type, a new system of rewards and recognition and incentives um, should enable diversification, the vitalization of careers, that it must acknowledge the independence and the qualities of individuals, you know, as well as their team performance. And that the um, that it's the quality of the work over the quantitative results, that all aspects of open science should be encouraged. And of course, that the leadership aspects in academic uh, careers and research and science are um, fundamental too, and it's 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 important to to value those. So some interesting ideas there around uh, programs that are doing, and of course also in uh, the Dutch um, National Academy has the uh, strategy evaluation protocol as well to support uh, this and to monitor it. So so that's one example, if you like, of a program and a policy. Uh, yesterday, Clifford Tatum, in his presentation, if you were lucky enough to follow it, showed this image all, already, but I think it's worth reflecting um, on again, because um, if you, in the answer to this question of which types of academic work matter the most for research careers, clearly the answer in 2009 was research publications. And I'm not sure we've progressed too far from there. There's something fundamentally wrong here where we practice and or where we preach about open science and open access. And unfortunately, those who we are want to, uh, you know, practice that or feel that it is the least important or possibly the most difficult for them to do. So there is no doubt uh, in our minds that uh, this is, you know, important. The time is now, if not a little late, but it's never never too late in, in, uh, in, in my world. So the um, just a, a quick moment on the next one. There are many uh, excellent references and guides on how to start, uh, you know, how to start this and what to include. My, uh -huh, my remote control has gone asleep. Um, ooh, and what not to. Ooh, what happened? Um, I'm sorry, I think I've lost the slides in my thing. But anyway, there are a large number of um, uh, indicators also available and the scientific metrics. So resources, you know, huge number of, from basic to very, uh, um, uh, you know, complex, if you like, indicators that are all food for thought. So, um, I, uh, so what will the registry do? for us and where will it fit in to this um, la vast, vast landscape. So of course we must uh, build on the recommendations and the existing outputs, yes, that uh, all of the, I mean, those few that I showed you there. So it's, you know, we need to focus on the integrity of research projects. They should be valued and not just the products. Uh, we must, of course, decide first on what the goals are and not, uh, not just what can be measured, yeah, because there's so much of an, uh, many unknowns in this. Uh, we must move beyond the declarations uh, and to practical implementations and pilots. So it's great to see the policies and to see the programs, uh, but this must also start to be documented. And, you know, um, we must have uh, the uptake, I suppose, of this is hampered by the lack of exemplars and the lack of evidence um, on what works and what, you know, doesn't work. And this is where we, if you like, fundamentally start from. So the registry or the research, uh, research, research assessment registry, the registry on rewards and incentives should be, we want it to be a publicly available, searchable and evidence-based online platform of the intentions and of the outcomes, yeah? fundamental 
the intentions as they started and the outcomes as they progress and are implemented of ongoing and future policy changes to the research reward and evaluation system. Yeah. So um, it is a, uh, I give you a sort of a sample view, if you like. Uh, we're very much in the nascent stages of this. Um, and I'll tell you where we are in the steps and in the implementation and the scoping of it. But just to give an idea, because it's always nice to have a picture, um, this open evidence-based approach should, of course, uh, be very much like a registry uh, of things. And it will um, be, if you like, encompass stakeholders and pilots of implementations of research and rewards from across the globe, as I said, in uh, from funders, from research performing organizations, and also publishers, of course, are the, are the ones that we want to see uh, provide the data uh, and maintain it updated. And of course, it must also be across multiple levels. So uh, the institutional level, the national level, the domain specific level too. Uh, so very broad, very all encompassing. The, um, the structure, if you like, around the uh, database is it would be, you know, a highly structured registry. Uh, this is how we intend it, of exemplars and to ensure searchable uh, uh, examples so that you can find, uh, if you like, examples that you're looking for that are ones that are important to uh, you as an organization or even as a stakeholder. So what sort of research and, uh, 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 you know, uh, and rewards and incentives program runs and how, in what scenario and in what context and, in, and how was that uh, valuable and how was it you know, in this context rather than that, is it something that I could look at for implementation in my scenario or in my context? So um, we want to ensure, of course, inclusivity and global. So you see that many of the organizations that uh, are now, if you like, volunteering and supporting us maybe are more North Hem Northern Hemispheric. Um, that's just as it happens around some of the funding that we're seeking and things like that, but nothing to do with the fact that this uh, must be global. And I don't think I can say that enough and inclusive. And inclusivity means also, you know, multilingualism, which we'll have to, um, uh, if you like, approach and uh, take into consideration uh, as we develop this. Yes. Um, but the successes and we want to use the successes to support. We want the people to be able to support, um, uh, you know, the broader uptake and adoption by others. Yeah. So the goal, the core goal is to capture both the intention and any subsequent outcome of each implementation. So you could imagine that um, we get, you know, there the intention is to run this program with these expectations, but we also it's important to capture what worked and what didn't at time uh, uh, phases, you know, over the, the timeline of the uh, of the actual program or the policy um, in sufficient detail so that we are able to analyze it and share the outcomes. So who are the stakeholders, the key stakeholders here? Well, We've sort of broken them into, into two, uh, primary stakeholders and uh, secondary ones, as you can see there. And we want, it's very fundamental, the success of this is the commitment by all of them and the engagement and the adoption by the funders and the institutions. It's key to the success yeah, of this uh, registry because this is an opportunity. It's a golden opportunity to share the intentions the data, the outcomes uh, of the interventions and what worked and what didn't in a collaborative and open way. And this is not currently available. It's not available. That's why we're doing it. We, we certainly don't want to be reinventing the wheel. So how will they be involved? Well, we have sort of three steps in the involvement of the stakeholders um, a, through a database, um, the intent of course, as well for uh, the pre-registration, if you like, of intent, and then the sharing and the reuse. You know? So it's a living registry. It's um, important because, as I keep, I can't say it enough, how uh, providing the updates on what works, what doesn't, what has been successful, metrics and things, allow others to then um, make an assessment, is it right or not right for them, and to share it. And also to you know not duplicate efforts in, in things that uh, are going. Yeah. 
So very quickly, uh, finally, the last slide. What it is, it's a mutual learning and knowledge exchange platform. It's global, it's open, it's community driven. It is not a monitoring uh, platform. It is not an evaluation framework. Okay, I can't say that enough. It's it's not for that. There are other areas around the world for policy monitoring and things like this. This is a mutual uh, uh, knowledge sharing platform. Huh? So um, the uh, very quickly on the funding and the governance, we're currently seeking funding in a short term uh, for grants in short term. But of course, the uh, longer term, we will be anal analyzing and we have many people on board who are well used to uh, the understanding around funding and longer term sustainability and different models will be chosen. And of course, the governance. One thing is, as we said, as I said when I started and I'll leave it then at that, is that it's initially managed by RDA, but uh, there are other areas that we need to uh, to to look into as to how this can be sustainable and structured in a correct way. How what it is though, it is uh, community governed, and it will not be. It will be a not for profit um, and adhering to the principles of open infrastructure, which all of the founding and driving organisations um, subscri subscribe to. So um, in the next steps, of course, we're seeking the funding. We're in the scoping phase now at the moment. We are working with stakeholders uh, and we're doing consultations with them. The first one will be on the 9th of uh, March, which we've invited a group of funders and organizations across uh, the globe to, to think. And we will we'll consult at different stages and in different ways with all stakeholders. Of course, advocacy that this is an important thing is fundamental too, and the communication and the outreach. Anyone who might be interested can please, um, uh, in you know, contact uh, or get the link to the uh, contact us for more information. There is a database that you can sign up to, and um, to uh, you know, get us let us know what aspect of it you would be in, uh, uh, interested in, and then uh, or send an email to the uh, web uh, mail, and one of the wonderful people will pick it up. And with that, I will stop because I think I've run over my time. Um, but thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Hilary, for that very interesting presentation. Yeah, uh, first of all, also congratulations on the continued growth of the Research Data Alliance. If I heard correctly, over 11,000 members now. So that's grown even uh, from last year's uh, statistics. Fantastic. We have two or three questions. I wanted to jump in for, for you all. And I had this question also yesterday. When I talk to journalists, sometimes they say that people these days, they don't read information, they swipe information. Basically, meaning they have a very short attention span. And so when we have these kind of databases and you want to make this available, you said publicly available. Is that something you all are looking into? You've got so much interesting work going on. But unfortunately, people in general are having shorter and shorter attention spans. So how can we get this data out to people? to capture their attentions when we have a, I will say loosely, a swipe generation? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, David, it's a very good question, I think. And um, I mean, that's part of the, five, the, the rationale behind the scoping and the stakeholder consultation, um, because we can't design this in a correct way uh, if we don't in, in involve all. And that's not just, uh, I would say, from the content perspective and what needs to be there and what isn't so that you can do the correct analysis on it, but you're very, uh, it's very true, the whole um, interface with which we provide this will be important. I think I talked about the multilingual aspect as well, which is something, it's not an easy thing to implement and it requires resources and that for us, but we must remember that, uh, as you say, people have different ways of accessing, different wishes of accessing, and um, fundamentally, we'll have to encompass all of those. Yeah, mm. so. yeah it's a challenge. Okay, fantastic. Um, we have, I just got the notice, we have over 200 participants viewing our discussion right now. Fantastic. And we do have some questions coming in. Let me read it straight from our chat board here. One question is, do you see a risk if we set up Open Science Award registries separately from the traditional science system? Could this lead to a split in the science system? Um, I might not understand fully the question, but I don't, I would not think so. Um, I think fundamentally, so when I tried to explain the registry there, the, the concept is that, of course, those funding 
um, those implementing and um, those monitoring are our primary stakeholders for this to be a success. So I wouldn't see it as uh, being a split. And I think actually that's the important thing. If we have a place where all of this information is available, um, that because we're not just talking about different nations, but we're talking about different practices in different domains. We had a wonderful presentation yesterday from Danielle Cooper now on data communities. And, um, and the differences, of course, uh, from one uh, discipline uh, to another, from one scientific domain to another, and, and from the Research Data Alliance, I would know that myself. It's a, you know, so it, it's not, we, I don't think, I, I wouldn't see the risk in that if it's done correctly. Yeah. Okay, super. Thank you very much. I got one or two more questions. And since you did run a little bit over, that's no problem. But I'll ask you to keep the answers brief so we can get on to our next speaker. But it's all really fantastic and interesting. Uh, next question we have. I still cannot really imagine what kind of initiatives should be registered. Can you give one or two examples, please? Okay, so I suppose the example, if I gave the example of the Dutch um, rewards and recognition one, because I showed it in the slides. Yes, yeah? so they have a... Uh, you know, come out with this uh, policy and this program and uh, of how they wish to implement it. So there will be pieces to that. So let's take one of the the, the programs, the things about, um, which I, I like very much, the, you know, rewarding around leadership. So we would, we would have a series of different pieces of information. What was included in that program? What were the expectations? What were the goals? Who were the, if you like, recipients of this particular, um, you know, what were the metrics and the, um, how would you call it, the frameworks used to monitor and to assess? How successful was it? Mm -hmm. uh, was it successful in this area, not in that? So, yeah, I, I mean, I know it's difficult to see. We have some examples. And uh, when we run some webinars, it might be easier. We'd be very happy to, to talk about it. Okay, super. Two more quick questions here. Number one, how is the registry different from DORA declaration? Can you highlight the main differences? Well, it's not um, it, it's not different to DORA in the sense that, in fact, that's why I kept I, fund, I, I underlined that DORA is very, very, very much involved in this. Um, DORA exists and DORA does both. The actual registry of all the implementations doesn't. So will this be on the DORA website? Will it be? I don't know. We haven't decided that yet but it's certainly going to be very, very much plugged into that, to, to the DORA uh, activities, yeah. Yeah, understood. And the final question, it's a long one, I'll try to read through it here. Thanks for the mention, I'm very happy to learn about your project. It seems there might be a co complementary dynamic between the openness profile and the RDA registry. What do you think about joining forces to look for potential alignment? Absolutely. Um, as I said, we're all about cooperation, collaboration and co-creation, no duplication of efforts where possible. So I'd be delighted to, we can take that offline. Very, very good, that's, that's great news. Yeah, and the final thing I, I wanted to ask you, and that is Hillary, uh, we also have our speaker sessions. I wanted to ask, will you be available today? And if so, do you know exactly when? I will, uh, I will be available for the hour. So from a quarter past 12 Central European time, till a quarter past one. So please join me there. I'd be happy. Fantastic. It is our tradition, even though we're all watching from around the world in our offices and homes, we give you a digital applause to our presenters. Thank you very much. And thank you to all those who joined and listened and for the questions. Really fantastic and very, very interesting.